Pearl Harbor. Everybody here know about Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941? So it's the event that really started this country into World War II. The Japanese attacked uh, the military base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and as a result, the United States entered World War II. Well, at that time, shortly thereafter, there was a movement to put all people of Japanese descent into what were called, um, they were called camps. And in reality, it was a jail. It was barbed wire guarded by military police and 120,000 people of Japanese descent, simply because what they looked like. We're told they could take one suitcase and they boarded trains to 10 different spots around this country and some of the most desolate places in this country. And they had to leave their homes, leave everything that they knew, leave their friends, all because they looked like the people who attacked us on December 7, 1941. Ralph Carr, who was governor of Colorado at the time, didn't believe that was the right thing to do. Because inevitably, when I speak to people your age about this, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually tell people, I was wearing a gray shirt today, and I thought about this, tell everybody with gray shirts to stand up. And then what would you say if I told you that you had a day or two days to pack one suitcase and you were going to have to leave your home, not knowing when you'd be able to get back, leave your job, leave your school, leave your friends, all because you looked like somebody who attacked this country. To put it in current terms for all of us, we all remember September 11th and how people of Arab American descent were treated afterwards and continue to be treated, frankly, in this country. But it's nothing like what happened after the attack in Pearl Harbor. And Ralph Carr, a Colorado native, said, if you don't preserve or protect the Constitution for all Americans, then we will not have it for any American. So there's a new justice center, kind of new justice center in downtown Denver right now. And if you go down there, it speaks, it's named after Ralph Carr. He's a true Colorado hero. And, and in reality, the message that I want you all to know about him is that as uncomfortable as it may be, as awkward as it may be, as hard as it may be to stand up and say somebody else is doing the wrong thing, that action on your part is the right thing. Don't stand to the side if you see people being bullied because of what they look like, because of what they sound like, because of who their parents are. It's just not right. We have an example in our state, in our state's history, of somebody who did the right thing. And as a result of that, he was being talked about as possibly running for president. And he lost his career because of that stand. He was willing to walk away to do the right thing. Now, inevitably, I hear when I talk to young people about Governor Carr, they all say, well, what would you have done? And as a reporter, I'd like to tell you that I, I wouldn't have been one of those people who are calling Japanese Americans names. And this may sound a little harsh, and I'm only saying what I'm about to say in the context of this story. But there were media outlets at that time, and I'll apologize for the language in advance because you may find it offensive, who actually referred to people of Japanese descent as yellow devils on the front pages of the Denver Post and pretty much every other newspaper around this state. Governor Carr said that was wrong. And a lot of people your age always want to know, they always ask, what would you have done? And I can't stand here and tell you that I would have been one of those reporters that said, look at this governor who's standing up for the Bill of Rights, who's standing up for what we all say we're about. We all say that we're about due process, that we're going to treat people well and treat them with their rights until they show that they no longer have earned those rights and deserve those rights. But I can't tell you that with any honesty. Because it's far easier to go along, to get along. We all know that. But in my life now, I now can rely on this example and this individual of somebody who did do the right thing and as a result was willing to pay his political cost by losing his job. So if you take away nothing else from this talk, because it's going to diverge onto a topic of science and true crime and the like. I just wanted, anytime I'm in Colorado and I have the opportunity to talk to young people, this is somebody you should know. 
in our history. And the reason you don't know him was because he decided to defend all of us and lost his career as a result. And now we're once again remembering because it's the right thing to do. So with that, I apologize for preaching. And I will go on to, so that's Ralph Carr. You can go downtown. You can read books here in the library. I'm sure Mrs. Livingston can find you books about the internment of Japanese Americans after or during World War II and about government, in case you're interested. OK. Now we're here to talk about if there's any similarity between that story that I just told you and this story that I'm here today to talk to you about, is that I find myself fascinated by so-called ordinary people. They would describe themselves as ordinary people, but then they are placed in extraordinary situations. And I'm always fascinated by how people act in those moments. What they do is what defines all of us. You find yourself in a tough spot. It's real easy to define who you are when times are going really well, and you have no challenge or no controversy or no nothing. But when the times get tough, and you have a tough project, you have a tough school paper to write, you have a tough relationship issue to deal with, that's when you really find out who you are. So this story that I'm going to share with you today is about a guy by the name of Arthur Caleb. And to understand why he's important, I need to see if you, oops, ah, hang on. Anybody know who this is? Yeah. Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh. Do you know who Charles Lindbergh was? What made Charles Lindbergh famous? The Fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. There you go. Charles Lindbergh. Sorry, that was a bonus because he participated. Um, Charles Lindbergh, in May of 1927, became the first person to successfully fly across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, we take something like that for granted right now. We don't really think twice about flying overseas. And yet back then, numerous people had tried before him to do this very thing. And anybody know what happened to all of them? They died. They died. Exactly. So the idea that this individual could potentially do the unthinkable really attracted the attention of this country. Everybody know who Christopher Columbus was? Yeah. So the night before he gets into that plane, in May of 1927, Lindbergh's own mom visits him in his hotel room. And she says afterwards, for the first time in my life, I realized, too, that Columbus had a mother. Hundreds of people turned out at the airport to watch on the morning of May 20th at Curtis Field, which originally or had been renamed in honor of Teddy Roosevelt's son, Quentin who had died in World War I. And at 7.40 in the morning with 451 gallons of gasoline and five sandwiches on board, Lindbergh got onto the plane. He was asked by a reporter if the food that he had along, those five sandwiches, was going to be enough for the trip. And he said, well, if I get to Paris, I won't need any more. And if I don't get to Paris, well, I won't need any more than I Twelve minutes later, at 7.52 New York time, he took off with the crowd cheering loudly. The world waited and waited anxiously. The image of a sole pilot trying to achieve the previously unachievable captured America like nothing else before it had. One New York newspaper wrote a, uh, an editorial called Alone. Is he alone at whose right side rides courage with skill within the cockpit and faith upon the left? Does solitude surround the brave when adventure leads the way and ambition leads the diet? Lindbergh fought fog, fatigue, and fear. And at 10 o'clock in the morning or in the evening, Paris time, on May 21st, 1927, 33 hours after takeoff, he landed successfully. And bedlam ensued. Lindbergh would later write that a French general there at the airport that day had told him. It's not only two continents that you've united, but the hearts of all men everywhere in admiration of the simple courage of a man who does great things. Now, this was not just America and Europe. Theater audiences in India cheered this on. 
in China, in Australia, in Africa, all over the world. And as soon as he got back to the United States, anybody have an idea what that big building is in the back? Washington, Washington Monument. Good job. So he ends up getting promoted when he successfully lands, comes back to Washington a few weeks afterwards. He's promoted to a colonel in the Army Air Corps Reserve. He's introduced to the country on live radio. 30 million people listen for the couple of minutes that he talks. He leaves with his picture on a postage stamp. The first time a living American had ever found himself on a postage stamp. New York came next, then St. Louis. All of these parades that he attended, literally hundreds of thousands of people would turn out. This is what it looked like in Madison, Wisconsin. That's his plane right up there, the spirit of St. Louis. He flew all over the country in an effort to promote aviation and people flying commercially. I mean, think back then, it's 80 some odd years ago, people didn't fly the way we fly today. Everybody drove, or they took the train. So to put this into perspective, how popular he was, in the few weeks from when he landed in Paris to when he got back to the United States, he ended up receiving three and a half million letters, 100,000 telegrams, and 14,000 parcels. So these are a couple of pictures. Sorry, it's a bad picture. But that's at Camp Randall Stadium in Madison. That's the football stadium right now. They had 55,000 people. OK, this is Charles A. Lindbergh, Jr., who was born on June 22, 1930, on his mother, Ann Morrow Lindbergh's 24th birthday. He was called Little Charlie, or the Eaglet, in the papers. And he literally became the world's most famous baby, a seven and a half pound instant celebrity. One of the, uh, the reporters of the day wrote, no royal child for whose arrival a nation waited with anxious interest ever attracted more public speculation before its birth or was watched more closely afterwards. So, that brings us to March 1st, 1932. On March 1st, 1932, Americans all over the country picked up their newspapers and read that Charles A. Lindbergh Jr., little Charlie or the Eaglet, had been kidnapped. Front page news all over the world, frankly. Took a day or so to get across the continent and to get across the world. It's all over the papers. So. Arthur Kaler, outside of his home in Madison, Wisconsin, was reading his copy of the Wisconsin State Journal, which is a newspaper in Madison, which described the kidnapping. And he reacted like any father with a son would. That's Arthur with his son, George. And George was 48 days older than Charles Jr. I looked across the breakfast table at my smallest child, a baby son, and I suppose I shuddered, Arthur Kaler would later say. His next reaction, though, his next reaction was less predictable, and it's why we're here today. You see, Arthur Kaler didn't focus on the ransom note or the chisel that had been left at the scene. Instead, as he read about the homemade ladder that had been left behind by the person who committed the crime, he said, quote, I grew excited. You see, that ladder, because it was made of wood, seemed just like a daring challenge. Within a few days after that, I wrote a letter to the Lindbergh baby's father saying that I thought it might be possible, might be possible to trace that ladder's steps and rails until the wood matched up with other wood so as to compromise the man involved. Of course, he said, I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but I have specialized in the study of wood just as a doctor who devotes himself to stomachs or tonsils or human vertebrae narrows down his interest to a sharp focus on the single field of his pet passion, so I, a forester, have done with wood. Arthur Kaler <coughs> literally wrote the book on wood, The Properties and Uses of Wood, 1928. It was distributed worldwide by the McGraw-Hill Company. He literally was the world's foremost expert on this topic. And he worked in an institution called the Forest Products Laboratory, which was located in Madison, Wisconsin. It's still there today. It's the world's preeminent research facility 
on wood. So for right now, what they're doing, to put it into current perspectives, um, anybody here a baseball fan? So they work with Major League Baseball to ensure that the bats that the players are using don't break nearly as often as they used to. I don't know if you remember, there were situations where bats were breaking and pieces were flying into the stands and hitting fans. Yeah, that was a problem when that happened. They're also working right now with folks that live in hurricane areas. They're testing out wooden doors to make sure that those doors have, uh, can withstand certain wind. Back then, in the early 1920s and 1930s, you're talking about an industry. Everything was made out of wood. Everything. Two plus million people worked and lived in the wood industry at that time. And so this is Arthur Kaler. He literally writes the book on wood. <coughs> this sign went out all over the country. And it was taped, stapled to telephone poles, plastered on cable cars, placed all over the country. If you ask your grandparents, maybe your great, if you have any great grandparents or great uncles or great aunts, if they lived during the 1930s, chances are their parents kept them inside for a long period of time, fearing that if somebody could kidnap the Lindbergh baby, no child was sick in this country. That's how scared people were. So this is the ladder that was used, as I mentioned, in the kidnapping. Let me tell you a little bit about this ladder. And again, as I mentioned, I'm not a scientist. So I'm going to try and make this as normal sounding as I possibly can, because it was hard for me to understand when I was researching this. So I'm going to try and explain it the way I know. This is what's called a telescopic ladder, meaning it can extend or compress, depending on how long you need it to be. And it's easier for transportation. It's not one of those fixed ladders that can't move in and out. Does that make sense? So it's three sections. And the three sections were each about these three sections. That, by the way, the second floor where the guy's standing at the window, that's where Charles A. Lindbergh Jr.'s nursery was. That was the room. So this is how the crime was committed. Somebody apparently climbed up this ladder, took the baby out of the room, climbed back down the ladder, and got away, all while the parents were in the house. And the baby didn't cry anything. baby apparently didn't cry. No one heard the baby cry. Yes, this is why this case has been written about for 80 years, because a lot of it sounds weird. Yeah? Actually, I thought the parents were on vacation, and then the nurse, the nursemaid was washing the baby, and she had put the baby to sleep and walked away and had come back and was gone. Part of that is true. She's actually, this is their vacation house. Oh, okay. So they're in Hopewell, New Jersey, but the, fan, the, the parents, Charles and Anne, are in the library <laughs> when this is going up. Um, and as was the custom back then, very rich people had nursemaids. So yes, they had somebody who put the baby to sleep. They didn't do that as parents themselves. Um, and then it's the nurse that finds out that the nursery is empty. So anyway, this is the three-part ladder. And each of these rungs or cleats, there were 11 of those. He numbered. Arthur Kaler is meticulous. Everything was measured down to the hundredths of an inch or even the thousandths of an inch. He has an opportunity finally to investigate this ladder. He's brought in by the FBI to actually try and help solve this crime because it's a year later, now 1933, and no one has solved this crime. They still don't know, and they've subsequently found this child dead. The ransom's been paid. The child has been found dead. Each of these rails is numbered 1 to 11. I'm sorry, the rungs are numbered 1 to 11. And then the rails on the sides, so things you're holding on to, that's 12, 13, 14, 15, and the top left-hand section is 16. And we'll get to why that's important in a sec. And the top right is 17. Okay. So this goes out all over the country. Pretty much Anybody around this country has seen one of these at that time. This is the ladder as it's broken apart. Now, Arthur Kaler from the beginning felt that this was, the reason he felt he could solve this or potentially help in solving this is that this was a ladder that wasn't found in a hardware store. 
This was a one-of-a-kind lab. It had been made specially for this purpose. Does that make sense? It's not something you go find at Home Depot. Okay. So there's Arthur Kaler with some measurements. Everybody back in those days wore a fedora. It was cool back in the 30s. It's now apparently cool kind of now. Um, and this is what he ends up doing. He ends up finding that, you remember I showed you those, the bottom rails, the wood, these two, 12 and 13? He ends up finding marks on these two rails from the machine that cut them. And he tracks it to a lumber mill down in McCormick, South Carolina. So while we may watch CSI these days and all these issues are solved within an hour, Arthur Kaler ended up having a right to 1,500 lumber mills and lumber yards around the East Coast in order to help get samples and track the wood in this ladder, those two rails, to this spot. So he finally gets to this spot. And then he ends up having to track the shipments of wood. So this is where it was cut. And he tracks it back up the East Coast. All of these different locations, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Newark, Brooklyn, New York, Stanford, Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, Boston, Massachusetts. He ends up visiting all of these places. And, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Only to get to a spot in Brooklyn, New York, where he finds the actual location where the wood was sold. He talks to the person who sold it, but they can't remember who they sold it to, and because they were in the middle of the Great Depression, they didn't keep records as to who they sold it to. It was only cash. So he hits a dead end. So in the fall of 1934, this investigation, two and a half years now, after this baby's kidnapping and death, this has hit a dead end. And then this guy. Bruno Hauptmann ends up spending $10 on, to fill up his gas tank, which only cost 80 some odd cents. And the gas station attendant finds it really odd that in the middle of the Depression, some guy's spending $10 on gas. And he writes down his license plate number. And ends up tracking back to this guy, and it's a bill that had been paid out in the ransom. So they end up arresting Bruno Hauptmann. And they go through his house in the Bronx. They tear it, pretty much they're going all through it, trying to figure out what's going on. This is the original court scene. It was a madhouse. That's Houtman over there. There are people all over the place. This is the crowd to get into the courthouse. This is in New Jersey, where everybody tried to get into the courthouse. That's the jury that's end up being impaneled. So I'm going to skip ahead here. This is what I want you to point out, or want you to pay attention to. So this is Bruno Hauptmann's attic. We are now up in his attic. Did anyone notice anything odd about this attic and how the wood looks in this attic? Yeah. There's some exposed wire, sure. It doesn't look like it's sealed up. No insulation. Yes, sir. Right up here? Exactly. Okay. Does everybody see that? All of these lines go straight forward, except for this right here. Seems kind of weird, right? What Arthur Kaler ends up finding out is that the wood, has anybody studied tree rings in, today, in science today? Let me put this into perspective for you. This was, in the mid-1930s, the idea that a ring constitutes a year in the life of a tree, right? It's called dendrochronology. You learn about it in science right now. If you haven't learned about it, you're about to at some point before you leave high school, because it's the one thing I remember about science class in high school. So the tree ring technology hadn't really even been popularized yet. The first study, or the first institute to study this doesn't come around until the early 1940s in the University of Arizona. So that's how cutting edge what, uh, Arthur Kaler is working on. What he decides and finds out, this was the attic board, and this was the rail, the 16th rail, so that upper left-hand part of the attic. And what he testifies to in court, there was a section missing there, is that these two were once one board. So now, he has physically brought Bruno Hauptmann to the scene of the crime. And in essence, he's turned an extortion case, because he had a $10 bill that was part of the ransom money, and they ended up finding 30 some thousand dollars of the ransom money at his house. So they've turned a ransom 
an extortion case into a murder case. Does that make sense? This is the garage where a lot of Houtman, where he apparently made the ladder. That's Arthur Kaler testifying in court mm -hmm. to this point. And after he testifies, he's literally described in thousands of newspapers around this country as the Sherlock Holmes of his day. Anybody, watch, anybody know who Sherlock Holmes is? It's the famous British um, um, detective, if you will. So that's Arthur Kaler in his laboratory. And I'm skipping through some things. Again, there's the board. This is a quote that I really stands out in many ways and has reminded me about why science matters. So when Arthur Kaler was interviewed by NBC News after the end of this case, this is what he said. In all of the years of my work, I've been consumed with the absolute reliability of the testimony of trees. They carry in themselves the record of their history. They show with absolute fidelity the progress of the years, storms, drought, floods, injuries, and any human touch. A tree never lies. A tree never lies. You cannot fake or make a tree. And so the important thing to remember in today's day and age, and I'm more than happy to open it up to whatever questions you may have, is that just because you find yourself in a position where you're studying something that is completely divorced in your mind from something else that's happening doesn't mean that it can't have real world implications. Arthur Kaler went to work in March of 1932 having no idea, no idea that he was going to end up finding himself literally the greatest scientist detective of his era. No clue. He had never done anything like this before. <coughs> Basically, what he would do is, if somebody was trying to build and they stumbled onto some remains, they'd send him the piece of wood to figure out what it was from. What kind of tree was it from? Was it a, an artifact, or was it just simply a throwaway piece of wood? No idea that he ended, would end up finding himself in the middle of the greatest trial of the 20th century, the greatest crime of the 20th century. And this scientific work that he worked on, Despite all of the people, and whatever you know about this Lindbergh case, you probably know there are a lot of people who don't believe that Bruno Hauptmann was the only one involved. Some people don't even believe Bruno Hauptmann was involved at all. But the one thing everybody agrees upon is this. There is not a skeptic out there who does not believe that the 16th rail in that ladder came from Bruno Hauptmann's attic. No one. The science is true.